Julie and I are talking you guys through how to create your own financial plan. So grab a cup of tea, grab a pen and a paper, and in the show notes, you'll find that we've created you a one-page financial plan. We will help you understand how to shape and create your own financial plan with some golden rules and some laws from Julie. So I think we're both literally on the same page, the same one-page financial plan on what is financial planning, but more importantly, the usefulness of actually having one. So I thought maybe you would start with a few of your big pointers, perhaps some of those golden rules or laws that you apply when you're doing a financial plan, and we will take it from there. Julie's golden rules for financial planning. Don't worry, there aren't many of them, and I have made them up. So rule number one, it's not about perfection. Because the second we do this, it's out of date and it's wrong. So I personally don't get really hung up on getting it exactly right. And I encourage my clients to do the same. And that is you can agonize over decisions about trying to get it precise. But the thing is, things change all the time. So it's a process and it's about guessing. I know other financial advisors will call it forecasting. I call it guessing. Isn't forecasting guessing but with some sort of education wrapped around it <laughs> well yeah there's the 25 years experience and all the qualifications I've got that make my <laughs> guesses better than your average person's <laughs> guesses but they're still guesses <laughs> so that's two rules I heard there the guessing that it is just guessing and it's not perfection was there a third one there is the other thing is is law number three there is money is not the only commodity. Mm. Neglect the others at your peril. So um, when you say the others, which mm. ones? So the two other commodities I think that we often overlook when we're trying to organise our finances, build ourselves a plan, and that is time and talent. Mm. And it goes back to a conversation you were having just before we hit the record button. We were saying in life, you go through life and there are all these trade-offs. You're constantly Mm. making trade-offs every day. And if you go chasing the money, you need to understand is you're trading off something there. And you're probably trading off your time. Mm. And it's asking yourself every now and again, which is more valuable to me right now? Mm. Is it the time or is it the money? And I think financial advisors are really guilty of just like, we just focus on the money, the money, the money. (laughs) Because Mm. oddly enough, that's what we do for a living. But I'll introduce the idea that, you know, you need to think about how you want to spend your time as much Mm. as how you spend your money. The other one is talent then. And this is one that, you know, with my financial advice, I have on. If you've got a a client sitting in front of you, you're trying to figure out how to help them achieve their goals and aspirations and dreams. We will typically focus on what we can see right in front of us. So that's the person, what they do, what assets they've got. But we don't don't think about what their talent is and what their capacity is to create more wealth or more time based on what skills they have. Mm -hmm. So think about what your talent is and how you can utilize that. And don't spend your time quite so freely. Mm. It's funny just hearing you say that, that the words that we use with money are very similar to the words we use with time, aren't they? The investing time or money, saving it, spending it. So you can see that those two naturally do coexist and there is that trade-off. The talent, I thought it was really insightful. It's not something that I've considered in terms of when creating a financial plan. Perhaps when I'm coaching, because you're you're working with someone forward-facing for where they want to go and what they want to do. And part of that is them using their talent for their development. But to hear it in that context, I think it's really interesting. Can I have a little conversation with you about the difference between financial planning and a financial plan? All right, I will see you, you you a question and I will raise you a question. Because <laughs> I was about to say to you, should we rewind for a second? Because shall we talk about what the flip a financial plan is? Yeah. And why you have one. <clears throat> yeah. So and then because we'll know what one is and why you have one, we can talk about what the difference is between a plan and planning. Because I think that's one supports the other and vice versa. So a financial plan and possibly If you were to ask anyone what they thought it was, it's you use a description of a sat-nav analogy. So there's a destination, and I think you and I are going to talk about what destinations possibly look like, and the route. So 
So in a financial planning plan term, those are often the actual numbers on the paper that generate the likelihood of arriving at that destination and planning that route. So I think if you were to ask anyone what a financial plan is, they'd be thinking it's my income, my outgoings, my assets, and it's very focused on the actual numbers. You and I are on the same page in that we think the numbers are far further down the line. What do you, would you like to ex- exaggerate? That's the wrong word. But <laughs> well, we know that's bit. what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> what is the word we're looking at? Expand. We'd like to expand on that, Julie. I think what you said there is really interesting because I've asked a few people this question, what they think of financial planners, and I keep getting the same answers coming back to me. Like, it's all about the numbers and the what mm. have you and all the data. I, yeah, that comes last. That comes last. And, like, if you come to someone like me, yes, I can generate a 40-page financial plan for you. <laughs> if I that's what really. you really want. <laughs> Personally, I try to present it in one page, but that's the thing. Financial plan can be as detailed or as high level as you want, but the numbers come last. It's about thinking about where you are and where you want to be. So the kind of on the sat nav thing here, right? So we've got a destination, we've got a starting point, and it's how do you want the journey to be between Mm. here and where you're trying to get to? Hmm. so it's all the life events I'm going to use the verb now that Kathleen and I both get a little bit funny about no doubt we'll come on to that that's goals <laughs> but it's how how do you want the journey to be how's the journey going to be for you is it going to be scenic is it going to be motorways and yeah. just and it's once you figure out what's important to you what you're trying to achieve then we start looking at what assets have we got to plug into the the route map to get you to where you want to be yeah and then you've got time working in two dimensions there one is the time from starting to where you want to be and then will you be using time along that journey as one of those assets and I think that neatly ties in then to where financial planning isn't a financial plan because as we both alluded to there that the numbers come last so if the numbers come last what's coming before the numbers when we're financial planning are you asking me I am. I'm going to give you a really technical answer. <laughs> what comes first? Yeah. <laughs> a shitload of questions. <laughs> <laughs> we love that technical answer. Yes. <laughs> I might have gone for a softer answer, mightn't I? The, the kind of open questions, the, the dreaming, the, the planning mm. in order to get to that. And I think this actually ties a little bit in with what sometimes gets called goals. And I don't believe that it is goals that we're setting in those questions aren't what are your goals what is your postcode what is your destination that question I I don't think leads you to to the right potentially the right destination or the destination in the way that you would like to have it so questions so for those that grab their cup of tea and their pen and their one page financial plan Julie and I will start with a couple of the questions that we would begin with if we were if you were a client with us so Julie do you want to kick start and then I will elaborate not exaggerate (laughs) (laughs) my first question I think it's a good one is why is money important to you yeah and that's where the space comes in because when we've not we're not being asked an an open a closed question of what's in your bank account and we're not even being asked what is your goal it's what's the meaning what does that mean to you so it's not necessarily something that you can come up with an immediate answer so just begin to get curious and write down some of those thoughts that are coming up to Julie's question and that's going to be something that you're going to carry on doing it's not something you will have necessarily finished by the end of this podcast I like to suggest Julie that we suspend our belief when we're asking these questions because When we are believing and knowing and thinking and feeling what we do today about money, that is not the same set of feelings, thoughts and actions that we will be having when we're on the journey or when we're on that destination. And sometimes let's start with that the question we don't like, which is what are your goals, (laughs) which is what gets in the way before we answer that are all the things we think we believe why we can't achieve that, why there isn't enough money for that, why that will never happen, why it hasn't happened before. So I think to just for a moment, park all of those 
beliefs, park all of those thoughts and those feelings, totally suspend belief and actually begin to think what money means to you. And on that, I would then probably expand into what do you want that to look like, that destination? If you were to paint it or draw it or create it, what does it look and feel like for you? Julie's gone blank. Oh, you're really asking me? No, I was kind of saying that would be the next step for me is to totally suspend belief because yeah. if you asked me something, I will come up with a whole load of reasons in the back of my mind of why that's not possible. But by taking away the impossible, you can then create anything, can't you? Yeah, and I think the purpose of these questions is it's trying to figure out what the drivers are for you and what you value. Mm. And that's why... I think it's fair to say we both think it's a bit bobbins to us. Yes, a northern phrase, that's polite. To ask somebody, right, what are your goals? Because invariably we get the same answer back. And I've referred to this in previous podcasts. You know, I want to retire at age 60-something with £2,000 mm. a month. Not a goal. Right, but it's, under, it's understanding about how you want to live your life and what's important. Once you start to feel a little bit more certain about that, the goals kind of sprout out of that. But if you don't do that first, you end up with the generic goal, which is the £2,000 a month, age 60, which is meaningless to you. So if I was your client or if someone who is listening, if they'd come up with a similar sort of starting answer, and it really is just a starting answer for them to explore on is, I want to retire at 60 with £2,000 a month. What would you then ask us next to get us to start thinking broader bigger differently yeah I would probably go with if so if you just said to me that that was your goal then I'm maybe going to come back to you with something like I've just hit the fast forward button and we know we all know at the point where you can have two thousand pound a month and you don't have to do what you're doing anymore what should we do next yeah and this is again why space is so important for this first part isn't it and I think it's do you find that people find this hard because we are just living for today and that we need time to, to kind of really let that sink in and to resonate and to start to imagine a different thing? I don't know if there's so much that we're living for today. I think it's too often we don't get the opportunity to think like this and nobody asks us these kind of questions. So... I don't know if to a certain extent we live life the way the brochure said. Mm. So the brochure says you're going to retire at age 65 and you're going to be walking along the beach hand in hand with some other wrinkly old person. And the brochure says that you're going to live your working life like this and success will look like this. And what we're asking people to do is throw the brochure away yeah. and write your own version. Yeah. And I thought that I was finding it hard for a different reason. So I struggled in the past at kind of imagining let's take retirement because it, it's an easy example and it's one that's come up is I couldn't get to a point where I could imagine where I wasn't working or I could imagine what I would be doing instead and therefore whilst I was contributing into my pension I was kind of doing it meaninglessly I was putting an amount in because I should contribute to my pension but without kind of connecting my today action with a purpose and that bigger picture but then by suspending belief or fast forwarding and imagining you know what does that look feel like what are we doing instead it becomes something you're gradually creating over and over again so I now have a much clearer idea and I don't want to retire I want to have some form of flexi <laughs> retire I want to still be having a purpose so, so I think to me retirement meant a lack of purpose so I'd be interested Julie if you were the client and I said fast forward to that date what are you doing what are you doing well, I have no desire to retire <laughs> <laughs> I love what I do but as you were talking there I was thinking about I can remember myself going through this process at the start and yeah I had all the same generic goals that everybody else had right <laughs> and the first sort of realization is I need to get my act together and start saving for the future so I applied all my money into pensions investments. And then when I took a step back from the generic goal thing, I started thinking about why is money important to me? Mm. So the words that are coming up are security. Mm -hmm. 
So then when I drill down on that a little bit further, it's all very well me plowing all this money into pensions and investments because that's buying me future security. I had completely ignored <laughs> present day security. <laughs> and so I thought the goals are not aligned with what's important to me because I missed some of that. Mm. And so understanding why money is important to me it led to that goal of saving more for the future. But then by drilling deep, I thought, right, well, now I need to build up a lot of cash savings as well, mm. because that's going to make me feel really secure because the pensions and investments were giving me security in the future, but it wasn't giving me security today. Okay. And so then I set myself a goal, right, well, I want this much in cash and I want it by then. What do I need to do to make that happen? Yeah. And this is why we do the thinking first and the goal <laughs> second and the numbers last. Yeah, and I could hear it as soon as you said, once you realise that security for now as well, then you took an action. So it's hard to take an action when we don't know why the action, what it is, what it's for, or what its purpose is. I asked my children what money meant to them, and they all came back with quite a similar answer. And, and this may be generational in that perhaps I've inadvertently fed it through. But the the words that are coming through from them are things like choice, freedom, certainly for my eldest son choice is really important to him he sees that as a way of maintaining his independence that he's not going to be dictated to he's a little bit like me he doesn't like to be told what to do so choices and money does bring choices when we don't have money the, the reality is there are fewer choices or our choices are shaped by trying to get to a position where money is there and available so and maybe that's what my retirement is I want the choice the choice to work on the day I want to work or the choice to to go off and swim or the choice to spend time with my family. But just think about that. Once, you, once you've got to that point there where you realise choices, freedom, security, whatever it is, is the driving mm -hmm. force for you. And then you look at how you want to map out your finances in that context. Mm -hmm. So you know that that, let's say it's choices is the thing that's important to you. So if we hadn't done that bit first, and you're all off trying to make lots of money, save lots of money into your pension and whatever the heck. But by doing that for the next 40 years, you've given yourself no choice. No. <laughs> so is that being aware at the start, right? I want choices. I value that. So if I commit to that career, that means that I'm trading off something. So it's just then asking yourself, right, well, is that how I want to do it? And it just makes you look at things differently. I think it's a, it's really freeing. Yeah. Yes. It's liberating. It's, I'm going to give an example, if you don't mind, Julia, of someone who I consider sensible with money and quite goal orientated, but never went through a financial planning or th this process that we're talking about. And it's actually my dad. So he's always worked he retired as a nurse built his savings built his investments and as you know he's now not very well but the part that was missing was what's it for what am I going to do with it what's that future and today look like and tomorrow and all those kind of points in between so the sensible money habits were there and they were brilliant and the budgeting the saving the spending all good stuff inverted commas but I think had he had a financial planner rather than maybe an advisor then it would have brought into those questions is what do you want to do with this what do you see yourself doing tomorrow what does that look like what does that feel like and how can we use your good habits and the money that you have to facilitate and support that for you mm. and I think I certainly as an advisor saw a number of older clients coming in having done that really good habits but nobody had ever sat with them and talked through why. I think it's not uncommon. Mm. And so that's why I think this first start process of asking yourself these questions is really important. So if you take the example, so let's say you, you sit there and you have a good think about it, and let's say you've come up with one of the biggest driving forces for you is freedom, mm. or whatever it happens to be for you, right? The next step is to ask yourself, so why is that important to me? Mm. what does that give me what would it mean not to have it that swapping over the the ideas as well so sometimes why is it important to me is is harder to ask than why 
isn't it? So looking at it from both angles, how would it be if I didn't have that? How would it be if I did? What's the pros of that? What's the cons of that? Because we'll get a different answer. So I think sometimes the first answer that comes up to us, maybe with the easier example is here, is when we have what we consider a bad money habit. Neither of us believe that any habits are bad. So I did invert comment that it's there and we're doing an action and we're doing it because it's doing something for us. So taking that space and to look at it from a different perspective is a really good set of questions to ask. So what are the positives and what are the negatives? If you are still with us, hopefully halfway through your cup of tea, I'm just going to recap then on a couple of questions that you could ask yourself because Julie and I just wander off in tangents. Well, I do anyway. So Julie's suggesting start with the question of what does money mean to me? Why is money important to me? To suspend belief, to start to fast forward to where that destination might be and imagine what you're looking, feeling, thinking and doing and try and pick out what your driving force is, what your purpose is. And then start getting curious and playing with those questions of what would it feel like to not have that? Any other good questions for our listeners, Julie, to get them going on this one themselves? No, I suppose one of the things you could do is, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but you can go and Google Kinder's three questions. Mm. Yeah. Let's not go down the Kinder rabbit hole. Right now, Catherine. No. But if you want to go and Google Kinder three questions, they will come up and they will stretch your brain. <laughs> They're good yeah. questions. Yeah. And I think you'll find number one is very similar to a lot of what we've started with. Today. But when you get to uh, number three, it's a little bit more challenging. <laughs> We're not going to challenge you quite that much during this no. single episode because it's not a, a singular event. So this is something that you're going to keep on thinking about and keep on developing. So let's say now that we've got to the point where we've asked some great questions. We're beginning to have a sense of what's valuable to us, what our money's for, where we're wanting to go and what we want that life to look like. What's next for financial planning? So... I think after you've gone through that first step, some, using air quotes, goals might be starting to make themselves apparent to you. So, for example, with me, it was the realisation that, ah, I need more money and cash in the bank because that's going to help me feel more secure. And so, well, that's a little goal. I can do that. And that's over a short time frame. So that that's going to go on the plan. Mm-hmm. I had my bigger goal of, like, I want long-term financial security. So that goes in the plan. I'm going to start guessing about some dates and I'm going to start guessing about the amounts that I might need. And I'm going to put some concrete actions in place. So lights all this, the emergency fund. Right, I'm going to save X pounds per month into that. And for the future, I'm investing X pounds per month as well. So little goals will start to pop out. They'll make themselves known rather than you going into the shop and picking one off the shelf, which says you want £2,000 a month. So is, is that right? Am I, am, I on, am I on the page? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the page. Yeah, the page. Yeah, I like the idea of goals making themselves known. So rather than what's my goal, is make the space to let the goal make itself known. The mini goals, I call them milestones. Maybe they're different. Maybe they're the same thing. But things that will need to be hit or encountered along that scenic sat-nav route in order to reach that destination. It's like landmarks. <clears throat> I'm going off on a tangent, folks. <laughs> so I used to do a lot of travelling between Liverpool up to Glasgow. I used to, I was on doing that road all the time. And anybody that's driven up the M74, if you're heading north on the M74 and you look right at some point and you see this big hill and there's a whole load of trees that are in the shape of a man thing, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, penis. Right, so there's shapes that look like that. And you look at that and you're like, oh, that means I'm only 25 minutes from Glasgow. Right? And any journey that you take, you will see different landmarks as you're going along. And that's how you like, oh, I'm on the right track. Yeah. And it's a little motivator. So you're like, oh, I'm 25 minutes from Glasgow. That's, trees aside, a really good benefit of actual the, the financial plan is that you do get those landmarks, those milestones, that confidence that you are on the right track. And if you've not seen it, that's a kind of trigger that, oh, hang on, maybe I'm not on track. So it's something to review. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just being extremely childish at Julie's tree landmark, but that 
that was partly because we had a pre-conversation, which I'm not going to share with you in and around the topic of the ducks that I keep. But I'm back to financial planning. So hopefully you're still on the document. Can I share something that I did just to see what your thoughts on how this could be useful or not useful? So we talked about retirement as a potential destination. I set myself a goal, and it was a goal about 10 years ago to double my income. But that's what the goal was. But I didn't start there. I didn't start with, I want to double my income. Prior to that, I had done everything you've just we've just talked about, which is understand what the purpose of that would be was for for me and my family what I might do with it how I might feel if I had it as I went through that I encountered a number of limiting beliefs which is why I would say suspend belief which is I didn't deserve that money I couldn't make that much money those kind of blocks roadblocks along the way so for me having that purpose of why what that money would do for the family and for our lives and how that would enrich us and how that would then help move on toward the other things so that goal actually emerged from the process that we, you've just talked about, we've just gone through. I set a time, which was one year. And then from that time bound goal were the mini actions I needed to take. So in order to get to that, I needed to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. So I did that, I achieved that. I was really proud of myself. So then the next year I thought, I'm going to do that again. And it went wrong. So it went wrong because by this point I'd moved away from what the purpose was and the beliefs, and those limiting beliefs came back up to bite me and self-sabotage that you don't deserve this, you can't have this. Mm. So I think part of this, there is a point to my story, part of this is if you are becoming aware of those beliefs, the little voices, the images, the emotions that are resistance, so if you become aware of that resistance, write that down because that will keep coming up along the way unless that is also worked through. I think that's a really good point. I guess going back to our journey analogy, they're the things that are going to go wrong, aren't they? They're the, the flat. The road shot. And, yeah. <laughs> the road There's shot. a diversion. Road works, diversion. So it's by knowing and expecting them and maybe preparing for you'll need to do something at that point increases your success of overcoming those obstacles and objections. We had a slight different analogy because we talked about this before, that it's not actually a postcode with our financial planning. Do you want to share what we think it is? Yeah, so it's, it's, this is my fault. I use this analogy that financial plan is a bit like using the sat-nav. So you get in the car, you don't turn the sat-nav off just because you figured out where you want to go. But the thing is, it's this idea that your life is not just a single destination. It's not. So Catherine and I are comparing financial planning to actually going on a road trip around Europe. So we have no idea what the final destination is. We've just got lots of things that we want to experience and things that we want to see along the way. And we're just going to figure it out as we go along because that's what the plan is. It, it will evolve. It will be wrong. You'll change your mind. You'll get mm. stuff wrong. Mm. And going back to what you said earlier, every single time you revisit it, you'll trade something off. So what the decision that you make today based on the guesses today, based on your answers and exploration, in two days, three weeks, three years, something will have changed and you're going to make a different decision or, or trade one off versus the other. And that's, and I think that's key to know is that this isn't a static document. And if we don't follow it, then we failed because we haven't. This is right back to law number one of Julie's. This isn't perfection. This is to enable progress. Uh, I think we're nearly ready to move on to the practical stuff. But before we do that, if that's so Catherine, can I just give people some tips on how to quantify the number goal thing? Yeah. Because it's dead easy for me to sit here and go, right, I want an emergency fund of X. I need to save that per month. And you sit in there, listen to this, you can figure that out as well. All right. Mm -hmm. And then we mentioned that one of my other goals was future financial security. So I'm throwing money into the pension investment. And this is the bit that's easy for me, easy for Catherine little bit more challenging for you because you're like how the flip am I meant to know how much I need to save for the future so this is where we get you do guessing so if you work with one of us we've got fancy clever technology and software that'll do it for us but there are some rough rules of thumb that you can use yourself so we're not going to get into a heated debate about the rule of four are we four percent rule no 
but we're going to throw it out there because it'll just help you get started. So there's this idea that if you've got a lump of money, an investment, and you withdraw 4% of that a year as income, you should not deplete the lump sum. So it's known as the safe withdrawal rate. And there's research that says this is right, and there's research that says it's wrong, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. But it's a starting point for you. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you're like, well, I would like £500 a month so let me, can I do that at 6,000 at 4%? It's about 4,000 pound a year. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you want, Catherine's going to double check this, right? But let's say you're sitting there, you're thinking, I would like to be able to achieve my goals, dreams, whatever. I would need income of 500 pound a month to do that. So 500 pound a month times 12 gives us 6,000 pound a year. Assuming a safe withdrawal rate of 4%, you would need a lump sum of, Catherine? Oh, I haven't got that far. This, can't we just do this the other way around and say that if you've got £100,000, that you can have £4,000 a year? <laughs> Would I, that um, not be? I'll do it here. It is. It's £150,000, folks. <laughs> okay. I went on to my compass instead of my calculator, but this is our fault because we're on sat and I'm heading north up the M74, according to my app. Yeah, £150,000, 4%. General rule of thumb, and it is a starting point. So when you're trying to figure out that, but I want X and I want it, then you're like, what do I need to do? Just the, just get you started. You need a target to work towards. It doesn't need to be perfect because we're not doing perfect financial planning. That no. would be a different podcast. It would be. <laughs> so having that goal, that not goal, target, target is a much better term. Then you you work backwards from that. Well, in order to achieve the hundred and fifty thousand pound by age x divide that by how many years there are between now and then and that tells you what you need to be putting aside or growing it to and share that between 12 now that number might be too big for today so it might be that you that takes having to save let's say 200 pound a month i've just made that number up and you know that maybe you're not in a position to save 200 pound a month but that doesn't matter you save 50 you save 70 you do a little thing you do a something because along the journey things are going to change your income is going to change you're going to build up the emergency savings you're going to be confident to invest and then start to benefit potentially from the growth so use these as frameworks they are there as a loose fence that you're working within but just because you can't hit that number doesn't mean you don't do anything doing something is better than doing perfect I'm going to make a sweeping generalisation and present it as fact. I love it when you do that. Everybody that has achieved their realisations, their goals and ambitions and is living the life they want, they all got there by doing one small thing to start with. Absolutely. And then they did another small thing. And then they did another small thing. And they so consistently did small things. That's how you get where you want to be. It's not Nobody walks in and can do it all at once. This is the biggest secret <laughs> It's yeah. the little things. There's something magic that happens here as well. It's not often, I think, that we do magic in financial planning. So I am going to present this one a little bit gingerly. When you decide to do something and it's a decision and you're taking that small, consistent action to it, because you're thinking about it, you're looking for opportunities to achieve it. So when you're not doing it, you miss it. It's a bit like, I don't know, when you want a dog and everywhere you walk, everybody's got a puppy. You've made a commitment and a decision to something that you're now thinking and our brains like to prove us right. And this is where something magic happens that I do not understand. But other things line up with trying to achieve that. So let's take that example of having to save £100,000 over, I'm going to say, 10 years. £10,000 a year feels impossible. But when you start that small action, and you're aiming for that target, other things seem to align with it. So you might think, well, I'll increase my income, or someone gives you a gift, or your Christmas money, you divert into it. Somehow or other, other things align with that. Whether that is psychology, whether that is a law of attraction, whether that is simply that we're evidencing it and proving it, I don't know. It's a bit like confirmation bias, is not it? Because if you aren't saving... Um, or you're not taking the action you're not thinking about it so you don't see the opportunity or you don't see the the thing that's come your way that you could have directed toward that so there's a little bit of faith stroke trust in that 
if it feels unbelievable today, maybe just believe that actually somewhere along the line, other things are going to align with that to, to help you to get that. Yeah. All right. Should we do some of the practical steps now? The numbers. The numbers? Should we, we start on the numbers? <laughs> All right. So on your one page plan, the next bit we're going to do, so we've got the tops, so the things are important to you, and then we've started to germinate some goals that are your goals. They're not off the peg ones. So now we need to start looking at the practicalities, the, the numbers we're going to plug into the plan to drive it. So the first thing I would like you to do is two columns. All right. So the first column is going to be assets and the second column is going to be liabilities. So in your assets, you're going to list things like if you own a property, that's going to go in there. Any cash you've got in the bank, any pensions, any investments, any other property you've got. And total it all up. Now in the next column, I want you to write all your liabilities. So if you've got a mortgage, if you've got any loans, any credit cards, any student loans, and where you owe people money, that's going in the liability column. And add all that up. <clears throat> then if you subtract the liabilities from the assets, what that gives you is your net worth. I like part of me is like, that's the American thing. I don't really want to get into that. But trust me, all right, this is a good number to know. Because, you know, at the top of your plan, you've written August 2022. And there's going to be an August 2023 one, isn't there? And 2024. And seeing that number change, mm -hmm. it gives you a sense of progress. And you can, you can feel yourself moving forward. Yeah. Because we all have so many segmented financial arrangements it's difficult to look at it as a whole and this number is just the thing that says i'm going in the right direction for what i want this is your tree landmark i title my columns what i own and what i owe simply you know what i'm like with words assets and liabilities they're just like big heavy words liabilities i own this i owe that and look that's what it says i'm with you on the the net worth number that you've got that progress because especially if you've got things in your O column and it can feel like you're in debt that you don't feel necessarily like you've got that progress but when you see it taken away from what you own as that what that net worth you can see that moving that I think also motivates us to work on the two sides of that column to to increase that number yeah and what I would say as well is if your net worth is coming out as a negative number don't worry Lots it's just things. lots of people have circumstances that take that. That's their starting point. Yeah. So particularly there's some professions when you come out of university and you've got so much debt and it takes you a while to get in the earning capacity. Don't worry if you're in a negative because mm. getting to zero is going to be such a bloody brilliant achievement. Mm. And then pushing yeah. on, that'll feel easy after getting yourself to zero. And if you've done it once and you're at that negative, you've now done the hardest bit because you've faced that tough number and there's just loads more room to grow so after we'll leave you guys to I think you might need a little bit of time just in terms of grabbing those numbers just before we move on to the next one you should get annual statements from your pensions if you've got any good apps that you're using that you can pull that from for a rough idea of your house value you should get your mortgage statement come through at least annually so have a look around, maybe create a little bit of a pile of where you're going to keep those numbers, but they are all accessible. It might just take a little bit of time on the first go to, to get them. And as they come through the post, when they come through, see them as a positive. So the next time that statement comes through, pop it in that pile for when you review your, your net wealth. Fantastic. So we've had a look at all this stuff you've got. Next step, I think this is step number four. So I think we're about to hit another golden rule, Catherine. Oh. Another golden rule. It's the next stage. I called it, in my own very unique, clever way, spending awareness, which is me trying to avoid the budget. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be aware of your spending. Here's a golden rule. Spend less than you make. If you can do that, you're, you're on course to be happy. You need to be aware of what you're spending and what you've got coming in. And this is nowhere near the painful process that it used to be. You don't need to sit down and go through banks. We've got apps that do this stuff for you, that will pull the data out for you. Or as you know, we are starling fans. 
Starlink will do it for you. But just be aware of how you're spending and just having that awareness will help you figure out, going back to step one, why is money important to me? What are my values and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. Then look at how you're spending money. Is there a disconnect there? Yeah. A good question to ask yourself there when you are spending is, does that take me nearer or further away from this destination? Is spending it somewhere else or spending it into my savings going to help me get to that destination quicker? So you've almost got a test each time you go online or you're out and about just before you're hit by it now. Does this take me closer or further away to my destination? I did that last night. What we, you weren't on Amazon again, were you? I was on Amazon. I am going to I'm going to reduce their profits by slowly weaning you off. <laughs> so my AirPod case is getting a bit shabby looking. I thought, oh, do I want a little skin for my AirPod case? And I thought, just leave it in the basket. Mm-hmm. Leave it in the basket and see what happens. Come back to it in 24 hours. Cooling off. And I did you have you decided? Are we still in the 24 hours? Oh, We're still yeah. in 24 hours. I, I did smile when you said spending awareness because firstly it made me think of the naughty drivers course because it sounded like speeding awareness. But awareness is really key. And I think it is a more gentle term than budget or spending plan. There are loads of apps that do that, as Julie's told you. So we're on spending awareness. What's next? Next is it's your what if game, Catherine. So we're having a look at, we're trying to figure out what have we got? (laughs) Golden rule, let's try and spend less than we make and then let's protect what we've got. So it's asking yourself, what if I die? What if I can't work? So what if my partner dies? What if my partner can't work? Whatever. It's the what if game. And then getting whatever amount of insurance to protect you that you can afford and feels sensible to you. All right, it's going yeah. to be different to everybody, but it's what feels right to you. Exactly. So what can't you afford not to protect? My youngest son refers to protection as the shield. So he's got this little idea that we're the person on this journey and that protection is your big superpower shield that's going to protect you from the stuff that tries to derail your plan. Financial cool. planning from a 12-year-old. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to do one of those controversial things now. So if you're looking at your financial plan, you're like protection thing. She's talking about protection. What does that mean? She means life cover, income protection and critical illness and all that kind of stuff. So if you're like, I've got some gaps there. See sorting this stuff out. Some of it is really simple. You don't need a financial advisor. There are loads of websites out there. Particularly life cover is a very simple thing to organize. So if you go on to the Money Saving Expert website, that'll give you a list of brokers that you can go to direct and organize these things. All right. And the reason I say that is because sometimes come to see a financial advisor or a financial planner, or whatever we're calling ourselves this week, it can be a bit daunting. All right. I don't need us for everything. What I would say is if it's looking to protect your income, right? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, get financial advice to do it for you. That stuff's complicated. And we're going to make sure you end up with the right thing for you. It would be quite easy for you to accidentally go and get yourself the wrong thing that will not work. But I think that's really important to to say is there's a lot of elements of money and finance that are very straightforward. Often the emotions and the language are the things that have gotten away to make it seem more complex. But it is straightforward. And everything that we've talked about so far, spending plans, choosing your bank accounts, your savings, even beginning your investments and straightforward insurance. Absolutely. Don't let that be an obstacle for you. You can do that. And we've done enough podcasts covering some of these products and the rules and the things you need to know. Go back and listen to them all. You'll be an absolute expert in pensions, licenses, ISAs, investments. So you can do this yourself. Absolutely. So it wasn't that controversial. Not at all. Oh. So we're protecting what we've got mm-hmm. to a point that is sensible and achievable for us. So next thing is, if there's debt, let's talk about the debt. Let's have a plan for the debt. So when I hear the word debt, I immediately break it into to two because 
I think some debt is part of this. And a mortgage would be a, a classic example. I'm going to live in a house, in a place I like to live, in a home that I love for my children. And if in order to do that, I'm going to leverage some debt, then to me, that's part of the plan. Unsecured debt or the high interest debts, I personally no longer have. So I think there is definitely a place to start in. Is that serving you? I think the first thing is to is identify what type of debt you have. Is it one you're comfortable with that's serving your journey? Or is it one that actually is getting in the way that you want rid of? And if so, to the latter, then how are you going to approach breaking that down? And that is a mini goal in itself, emerging. One of the goals along your financial plan is potentially to clear that down. And then it's a bit of a calculation, kind of the opposite calculation to the savings calculation, would you say, Julie? And I think the thing is, so the big red flags on debt, where you make, you're like, want to take action here, is it's normally credit cards or payday loans, store cards, things like that. So with the personal loan or with the mortgage, you've got a debt term and an interest rate that's usually fixed. It's the other ones where it just kind of waves around. So these are the ones you want to target. If you've got some outstanding balances, let's have a plan to get rid of them. So golden rule number one, at least make the minimum payment, direct debit, so that it's done every month without fail. So you're not messing up your credit score. If that's all you can do right now. Then part of your plan should be to work towards getting that down. So even if it's just an extra five or a month to start with, and because remember, it's just little steps, right? Because it's five in this month, and then a couple of months might be a 10, and then we could maybe 50 pounds. But it's working towards getting rid of it. So that needs to be in the plan. And I think it, that's costly. There are a couple of ways of approaching it. Do you pay off the high interest ones first? You pay a little bit off everything. But like Julie says, minimum payments on everything as a minimum. But that's not going to pay it off. That's just going to keep you treading water. So, And it can be done. I think it's that same emotional relief that when you try and imagine having savings, it, when there's a big number and we're sitting here where we are today, it can feel overwhelming. But those little, little consistent steps that Julie mentioned, it can be done, it will be done. And that's one of the milestones you're going to pass through on your financial planning journey. So we've looked at all the stuff we've got. What do I own and what do I owe? What have I got coming in? What have I got going back out again? Protecting what I've got. Looking, We're looking at the debt. I guess the next thing is to look at savings. Don't be like the very experienced financial advisor like me that didn't have much in cash because I was all about future security. <laughs> you want some money in the bank, folks. Uh, there was a survey. There's always a survey. But Lloyd's revealed this week that it's a ridiculous large percentage of us have less than £500 of savings. So if that's you, you're not alone. Now, I'm just going to pull you back one, Julie, because when I was talking about debt, you know, I was start to think about investing. And I think it's the same about savings. If you've got debt, that does not mean you cannot save. It does not mean you cannot invest. It just means you're going to have to make a trade off looking at which one you're going to prioritise in what amount. But if you've heard the myth that you cannot invest or save if you've got debt, I would really challenge that because those cash savings what will prevent a future debt when one of those what ifs comes your way. So I do think this is a two pronged approach of paying down debt and building savings. They're like anti Dave Ramsey, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta yeah. be honest. So like being practical, let's say you're sitting there and you're going through this process and you've realised, right, I've got £100 a month I could allocate to some of these mini goals. Mm -hmm. So it might be this credit card balance that needs paying off. It might be that you wanted to build up some cash savings and it might be that you wanted to buy some extra protection. And you're like, well, do I put the whole £100 in something? But Catherine and I say no. We're not yeah. sending the whole £100 to the debt, are we? No. no Divvy it up between those three goals and a balance that feels right to you. Yeah, and review that. Because as you pay one of those little debts off, you're going to move a bit more over to savings. Or as a, a different what if comes, then you're going to review your protection. So this is a movable feast. And I think this is the, the rule that we often talk about in investments. It, I, it's diversifying. It's diversifying your own finances to be prepared for lots of different things. So, yeah, if you've got £100, even if you've got £10, whatever it is, take a proportion and put it toward the different mini goals. And I don't know if it's just, it's a mindset thing as well, because this is a personal thing. You can put the whole hundred pound towards your debt if you want. But from my experience of working with clients, and I think Catherine's going to be the same as well, 
that while you're just focusing on the debt, you are spending longer in the mindset that I am a person that is in debt. And it's longer where you're not thinking, I am a person that saves. And yeah. So you become conditioned and it's taking you longer to get to the point where conceptually that you could ever believe that you're someone that has savings. That's a really interesting point. And you're building a habit from that mindset of paying debt off, but doing it with this suggestion of approaching both, you're also building a habit of automatically consistently building savings. It's interesting. I was going back to our columns of what I own, what I owe with a focus on that net worth, you, the net worth would be the same, whichever outcome, aside from investments you took, wouldn't it? Because if you pay the 100 off on debt, you reduce the O column and the net worth changes. So that's still going to progress in the same way. But it's very personal. It's your £100. It's your debts, your, your plan, and it's your savings. So just sort of sit back and maybe weigh up is it more important to you to have the security of having a little bit more in cash or is it more important to you to feel released and free from from your debt I don't know if you've seen this as well but I know it's certainly with some of the people that I've worked with is that when they've gone for the debt first and then the debt gets cleared mm-hmm. more debt appears and I think because that has been the goal I pay off debt and then debt's been cleared exactly to go and get more yeah. debt so I can pay it off <clears throat> exactly so I mean that goes back to what you've just said about mindset and what I said about that daily habits that this is the habit we've got and also what we said earlier about the the brain will look for proof it's looking for this thing that it does and so there is a lot of merit to splitting it into the two different habits so I am a saver I've cleared my debt and I am a saver so I think we're kind of on to the last leg now which is all about the building well. So it's having savings and sort of starting to invest as well. It's sort of the final steps. Yeah. Again, where do you when do you start? So I would say that even if you have debt, as long as it's not uncontrolled and it's not particularly high interest, that's not a reason necessarily not to invest because I still would say save. Before you invest, make sure you've got that cash cushion. But don't say... If you're finding I've got debt, therefore I'm not ready to invest. That's not necessarily so. It might be in your case, but it's not necessarily so. So if it's controlled, if it's low interest, I still think that there's an argument to invest because we know going right back to the commodities involved in your financial plan that time is a really key commodity. And we know with investments that the longer you invest for, the more likely you are to to build that wealth. So that would be my first point. Don't write it off just because there are, is still some debt. And I know that that is not what all financial planners and advisors would say. That is just my opinion. I agree. Oh, we're doing really well today. We haven't actually not we really done anything. Did it, we were checking before we started. Are we on the same page? I'm like, yeah, we are. Yeah. Thank God, because it's only one page. It's the one page. <laughs> yeah, yes. But yeah, so, we're on the same page on this. So. Yes. <laughs> and I think this is also just to talk about what you said earlier, that a small action is better than no action. And this is something you can do yourself. So if you have no investments, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. So there are ways and means. We've done some episodes on investing itself. So do pop back and listen to those. And we'll probably come back to it again. But just for today's financial plan and investments, any guidance from you, Julie? So we're talking about building up cash savings. One of the things I would say is go back and listen to our episode on emergency funds. Because that's going to give you some really good tips on how to start building up your cash in the bank. So there's loads of things there about automating, about mindset, about roundups, all these cool little things, all those little tiny, tiny things that get you to the point where you can afford a £10,000 car problem. But we don't talk about that anymore. So get your cash sorted. And then the next bit is the savings and is the investment bit. This is not as complicated as people would have you believe. Because I see people agonizing. I see financial advisors agonizing. Well, should we use the ISA or should we use the pension? Guess what I'm going to say? Both. <laughs> yes. And instead of or, I think yes. that's actually what you were going to say. Wasn't you it? want an ISA and a pension. <laughs> So I think we're about to stumble upon another golden rule. Golden rule alert. Auto-enrolment, workplace pension, just make sure you're in it. 
<laughs> for all the reasons we've previously previously mentioned in the pension episodes is free money get all your free money so make sure that you're auto enrolled and you're a member of the workplace pension where that's available and then with any extra extra cash you've got is right well do i go down the pension or do I go down the isa route now where people start to get a little bit mm, going down the rabbit hole is if you're a higher rate taxpayer then yes the pension is the more attractive option from a calculations point of view because you're going to get higher rate tax relief but that money is then tied up and you can't get at it and it'll get taxed on the way out yeah. whereas if you go down the isa You've got a lot more flexibility and you can get it sooner and generate a tax-free income. So that's why we're saying and, not all. Have them yes. both. Have them both. And I think this is, it's another trade-off, but this is where you come right back to the beginning questions of what's this for? What's the purpose? Where's the destination? Because if your destination, you need to get there before you're 57, which is what it's effectively going to be in a couple of years, then the pension's not going to help you with that at that time with that particular achievement but it is definitely going to help with anything post that age if you've got milestones along the way where you need money sooner than your your pension age then it might you're going to weigh up i just see it like little scales i'm doing this with my hands like libra to which part's going to go to which so go right back to to what you're doing this for what's that tour of europe that those destinations you're going to have along the way and that's going to just help inform you and help you make a decision based on how much goes to here and how much goes to here. And then, you know, if you've got a house you're buying or your children are buying along the way, then there's other choices with ISAs. So don't look at it in isolation of the product. Look at it this together with the purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And then depending on your age and eligibility, so I've mentioned pensions and ISAs. One of the other things you may want to look at as well is the lifetime ISA. If you're yeah. as old as me, you're not allowed one. <laughs> if you're younger than me, you might be allowed one. And then let's say you're sitting there, you're like, this is great. You've told us to max out the ISA, max out the pension. I really hope you're going to tell us something else because I'm doing that already. If you are in the position where you've already done this, the next uncomplicated step is just a general investment account. And... If it looks like you're actually going to end up triggering capital gains tax, it's at this point you probably do need a financial advisor because everything I've mentioned so far, you can do yourself. But once we've got to that stage, bringing one of us in will actually pay for itself yeah. because the things that we can do to save you tax will dwarf whatever fee we charge you. So that's, that's when you get us in. I think if you're at the beginning of that journey, and you're just starting ISAs, potentially licenses, pensions, then certainly there's enough information out there. If you educate yourself enough, you're willing to learn for you to do that yourself. I think complex comes along the way, an inheritance, or you've maxed out one of those, or you think that you might be having a trickier complex issue, then absolutely. And I think advisors are a little bit like accountants. You will get back more than you pay in a fee. So don't let the fee be an obstacle to that. I raised my eyebrows there that financial advisors are like accountants. I'm like, no, we're not. We're like the rock stars of financial uh, services. When I said like accountants, it meant in terms of saving the money. So, you know, if this was that roadmap, we should really just do this as, in my head now, or like I see it's a board game, this little game of lifestyle thing. That's just going to be one of the mini road diversions along the way. But I think we have covered all the key points. Now, I can I just wind back one thing? Because I think we've forgotten something. Did we? Is this going to be wills? But if we've got our protection, I really, when you're doing this plan, you, you have to write the will. Go back to the wills episode. Go back to the family legacy episode. Don't let cost or the fact you don't want that conversation because there's nothing that can derail your financial plan for your family quicker than not doing that piece of estate planning or will planning. So that's all I'm going to say on that. Well, if you're having your moment, I'm going to throw in power of attorney. <laughs> right, just write it down, people. Yep. You need a will and you need a power of attorney. Just trust me, you need these things. Hopefully you've got to the end of your, your one page, even if you've not got all the numbers, but maybe you've just got a little bit of an exciting idea, a seed planted for what your plans are, what your purpose is, what money means to you. What's that 
route and destination going to look like? And then started to add your guesses, your best guesses, and then become more concrete from there. 